All right, perfect. All right, well, thank you everybody for uh, for joining. I really appreciate uh, everybody jumping on and uh, joining us for this webinar. Um, so just a quick little history on Virtual Z, if this is your first time uh, attending one of our uh, webinars. Virtual Z is a um, data access company focused on uh, providing better access to mainframe data. And so all, all three products that I'll briefly talk about uh, do reside on the mainframe. So we are a software, a mainframe software company, um, uh, and we'll get into the weeds of one particular product, Propel Z, um, uh, as we go through this session. Um, but yeah, we specialize in um, providing access to mainframe data in a very agile, low cost, uh, a low cost and effective way uh, for customers. So on this webinar, um, We'll talk about uh, the objectives of Propel Z, uh, what really motivated us um, to develop this product, um, the overall Virtual Z offerings that I briefly talked about. Uh, we will get into a fairly detailed demo. It's about 10 minutes long. Um, it is a recorded demo, so um, I'm pretty confident that it's going to run pretty well, um, and it provides a good amount of detail for you guys. So, um, and then we'll get into the summary and cost and some of the additional details around Propel Z. Um, and then um, pricing questions and, and everything else at the end. So, all right. Um, well, as I mentioned, Virtual Z is a startup, uh, woman founded, woman run. Um, actually, it's really the first ever um, woman founded uh, mainframe software company uh, in the history of the mainframe that we know of. Um, we've got tons of experience on our team, uh, over 200 years of experience across the team with mainframe, either selling software or developing software. Um, and so we've got a pretty unique perspective on some of the challenges that exist on the mainframe. Um, and some of those challenges that we've experienced and seen over the years are clients really focused around business agility and how do they achieve business agility with their mainframe applications and mainframe data. Um, talent, we often hear that talent is a big challenge within the mainframe, uh, trying to find people that understand assembler or learning assembler with a good amount of folks that understand it today, um, retiring uh, and moving on from the workforce. And then cost, honestly, there's a ton of cost um, that clients are constantly complaining about when, when it comes to the mainframe. Um, some of that's perceived cost um, that might not be ju always justified, but there are some areas and, and uh, capabilities to allow you to save money um, when it comes to your mainframe and, and, and uh, running software on your mainframe. And, and we'll get into that a little bit um, as, we, as we explore our products and focus on Propel Z. So we really have three products that we go to market around, Lozen. Lozen is, again, running on the mainframe, provides access to applications running off the mainframe. Uh, full read-write capabilities to any of your file file system um, file system data that you have today. So things like vSAM, QSAM, um, Lozen provides full read-write access uh, through APIs or through uh, direct NFS connection. Uh, Zach is essentially the opposite of Lozen. Um, it provides access to data running off the mainframe uh, to your applications that are running on the mainframe. So Assembler or COBOL applications looking to access MongoDB or some of the storage capabilities that are running off the mainframe, um, that provides that access. Propels is the product we're going to focus on today. So Propels, we often describe it sometimes as a utility, um, but as we've had several conversations over the years with clients, one of the things that our clients are constantly asking about is how do I get a copy of my data to the cloud quickly and in a low cost way? So obviously there's ETL solutions out there, there's change data capture solutions out there, there's event-driven models that are out there, but those can be complex, those can be um, challenging to implement, they can take time, um, when really all you're trying to do is take uh, mainframe data that might be in a complex format, um, something like vSAM or QSAM, and replicate that data into something that a cloud native developer um, can understand and use. And after getting a lot of feedback and a lot of questions around having that capability, that's really what motivated us to, to write and create Propels. So what is Propels? Propels is, again, um, a, a utility or a piece of software that runs on the mainframe. It's zip eligible, and it'll take your 
file system data, VSAM, QSAM, um, and replicate that to any sort of data source that has a JDBC connection. So if your first step is to migrate your vSAM data to a MySQL database, a Postgres database, or a MongoDB database running on Z Linux, we can do that. Yeah, a simple command line after you install Propels, which can be up and running very quickly, most likely within a day. You tell it the copybook essentially, you tell it um, the destination, you just verify the SQL statements and everything that you want on the end for JDBC, and we will do all the data transformation for you and actually write to those, um, those databases. The same thing can be applied if you're not running on Zlinux, but you wanna run in the cloud, you wanna run in the private cloud, um, wherever those data sources sit, we can connect to and we can write um, your vSAM data and copy that vSAM data to um, those databases. The idea behind this is it's very low cost in the sense that it runs on zip. We don't charge a lot to about a lot, a lot around or the for um, Propel Z. Um, and I'll get into the costing in a little bit here. Um, but it's also very easy to use, right? So you don't need to understand a ton about um, COBOL or be a you know a um, a mainframe developer necessarily to maintain a bunch of code where you're developing a whole lot of new COBOL code or similar code to access this data, you know, put it into a copy book, replicate it, um, you know, massage the data, and then try to send it over to the cloud. Right? We take care of all that for you. So this is a low cost, low maintenance, no code utility. Um, that you that you can have up and running, like I mentioned, within a day, right? It's pretty simple to install and and configure um, and and get executing. So, all right. So now I will show you our demo, and this demo is available on our website as well. Um, we did have a little bit of challenges around um, the microphone for for this and the sound. So I do encourage you to uh, turn up your 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 headphones or. Uh, your computer's uh, volume as much as you possibly can, um, but please let me know if it's if it's too low. Um, I can kind of narrate it as as we go as well. Welcome to this demonstration of the new Virtual Z Computing Propels product. We've heard from our customers the need to provide a simple means to automate copying data from IBM Z to a variety of former data center databases and data lakes. In particular non-SQL sources such as file system based data force users to purchase and implement expensive, complex, or cumbersome multi We created the new Propels product to address this need in a very simple, usable way. Propels can be used to quickly and easily create a copy of mainframe data such as vSAM files and load that data into hybrid cloud environments where you can use your familiar database and BI capabilities. We use a well-known and widely used method known as JDBC or Java Database Connectivity. JDBC was created to allow Java programs access to relational data in a uniform way that is compatible with nearly all industry standard or newer emerging database servers. Just as a quick example, here is a partial list of the database products that support JDBC. These should be familiar names, but this is just scratching the surface of what is possible. Because we use JDBC, Propels can load data into any of the databases with a simple configuration change to locate and access the target database. Let's take a look at how this works. First, we'll review the sample data set we'll be using in this demonstration. vSAM, unlike databases such as DB2, does not embed any information about the structure of the data, commonly known as metadata. Relational databases store the structure of the data, including table and column names and column data types. vSAM and other file access methods on IBM Z are described by external artifacts, such as COBOL copybooks. Furthermore, the data encoding format used on IBM Z, EBCDIC, is not standard on most cloud and distributed servers. Unix, Linux, and other distributed systems, such as Windows servers, use ASCII or Unicode variants, such as UTF-8, as their storage format. Automated data transformation is an extremely powerful feature that Virtual Z provides out of the box. Data being retrieved from IBM Z by a client running on Linux or Windows can be automatically translated into a suitable format. 
The complications for doing this include not only the code pages, EBCDIC to ASCII, for example, but also the native data types and field formats that are used by data sets on IBM Z, such as packed or zoned decimal, various binary formats, date time formats, etc. The Virtual Z data transformation capability can read COBOL copybooks or other formats such as user-created XML documents to understand the structure of the data. We can then fully transform the data field by field during the data transfer. Now the data can be easily accessed in formats that can be understood and manipulated by applications and users on Linux or Windows operating on cloud or customer data centers. Now, back to the demo. We've logged into our mainframe, and the first thing we'll look at is the COBOL copybook that describes our demo data. This copybook furnishes the metadata that we'll use to understand the structure of the file, including field names and data types. We see a mix of character and binary fields, including some double precision floating point numbers that could be used in calculations, or in this case, geolocation. The file contains data about all the world's airports. It's a medium to large data set containing about 76,000 records or rows in relational database terms with a total size of about 100 megabytes. We can look at the vSAM file using IBM's file manager to see the airport information that is contained in the file. We can also display some information about the vSAM file type. In this case, it is a KSDS or key sequence data set. We can see that it contains 76,358 records. Going back to the data, we can scroll through the records or display them in a hex dump format. Here we see that the first field is binary and the character data is stored in EBCDIC format, as is usually the case for data on IBM Z mainframes. Now let's take a quick look at our configuration options for Propels. We have switched to an IBM Z Unix System Services shell session to view our configuration. This is also where we will execute the Propels Java command line. The first thing we see is our configuration file that describes where we are going to put our data, the database type and connection info, including user credentials. Finally, we can see the configuration for the data transfer and database table population. These are default values that will just work out of the box, but if you want to customize these, it's easy to do just by editing this config file. To be clear, you will get a reasonable and useful result without changing these options. One further point before we move on. Notice the array underscore table line in the config. This is another type of automatic transformation that Propels provides. COBOL programs commonly use occurs clauses to store repeating fields embedded in vSAM records. SQL requires the repeating fields to be available as rows in a separate table related to a main table. Propels will automatically extract the repeating fields and create the expected tables and relationships so SQL queries can easily process them. Let's now invoke our command line. We've logged into our mainframe using SSH or Secure Shell. We use a relatively simple command line. This can also be embedded in a script for repeat or automated execution. We enter the command with some options, such as our config file, the name of the vSAM dataset we will copy to the target database, and the name of the COBOL copybook we'll use to drive the transformation. As we execute the command, we see some progress indicators on the screen. As the command starts up, it accesses the vSAM data, connects to the target database, runs the transformations, and begins to send it across the network in efficient batches of records. The command completes fairly quickly, and we get some statistics about the execution, including the number of rows inserted into the database, which matches the number of records in the vSAM file we previously viewed. We also see elapsed time, CPU time consumed, and the number of rows inserted per second. As you can see, this is a very quick and efficient process. Now let's go look at the results. We'll first take a look at our cloud MySQL database using the MySQL Workbench. On the left side of the screen, we can see that the database contains a table called Airport Demo, which is the name we specified in our config file. We can expand the columns and see that the columns are named the same as the field names that appeared in our COBOL copybook that we looked at on our IBM Z mainframe. Inspecting the details of the resulting columns, we can see the MySQL data types into which we transformed the EBCD character data in IBM binary formats. The character data has been transformed to UTF-8, a common Unicode format. We see our integer and double precision floating point fields as well. If we run a simple select asterisk SQL query, we can inspect the rows and columns of data that we inserted in this table. The data is returned exactly as we expected. 
All of the records that were present in the vSAM file are now represented as table rows and columns, and we can see the data have been transformed into the expected data types, UTF-8, character data, floating point, longitude, and latitude, etc. We'll use SQL capability to filter the data to a subset of the rows. If we insert a WHERE clause into the query, we can select just the data for a particular airport by airport code, in this case LGA for LaGuardia Airport in New York. We run the query and now we see just the single row for that airport. Now let's take a different view using a more end-user oriented BI reporting tool. Here we see the data selection view of Tableau, a popular BI tool that is integrated into Salesforce CRM. We've connected a Tableau session to the same MySQL database we populated from the IBM Z vSAM data that we saw earlier. We can see the same airport table and column names we viewed in the MySQL workbench. But now let's take a more useful view of the data than just rows and columns. With the power of graphical business intelligence provided by Tableau and indeed by many similar BI and reporting tools, we've selected an out-of-the-box map explorer and populated it with our airport data. Using the latitude and longitude columns, we can precisely place all the airports on the map. As we hover over an airport location, we automatically get a handy pop-up with details such as airport name, city, URL, and other details. We have various filters we can use to further tailor the display. If we want to also see airports that can accommodate seaplanes, with a simple click of the selection criteria, the map immediately updates with that additional information. We can also leverage the geographical information to quickly add the medium and large airports in Mexico, for example. It is easy to see the value and ease of use of this approach to accessing and obtaining mainframe data on demand under end user control, rather than complicated and expensive data pipelines managed by overburdened data center staff, you can provide your users the data they need and just the data they need with a few easy steps. Thanks very much for your time and attention. Please. So um, uh, thank you, Richard, for that, uh, that great demo and, and recording. Sorry about some of the, uh, the challenges there or to, to getting that started. Um, now what I'm showing is a overall summary of R3 products, and then I'll focus on Propel's there in the middle. Um, so as I mentioned, right, um, Propel's and all our products are zip eligible. Um, we can connect to any data source um, that has a JDBC connection or driver available to it. Um, we also can do all the data transformation, right? So we take in the copybook um, that you put in the command line and we can take that data from the vSAM, vSAM file, for example, uh, and convert it into JSON, XML, CSV, text binary, whatever you choose, right? Um, consumers, right, of the data um, or of Propel's um, right, our you know existing ETL tools that might be running on the cloud that now have access to that data. Um, you can put those into your AI models um, or any your databases that uh, or data stores you're using for for AI. Um, obviously, reporting analytics like we had in the uh, demo, um, and then you could also do direct cloud native development uh, if you wanted to. So, if you wanted to offload reads, for example, from your mainframe. Uh, and create new capabilities or new application, applications connected to uh, data that's uh, static um, or doesn't need to be replicated in real time, um, then you know, Propels is a great solution for it. Um, so pricing, uh, we do have a free version of Pro Propels that allows you to do uh, 10,000 rows at a time um, of execution. Um, it also is limited, uh, so it's not unlimited from, a, from uh, you, you don't get five years access to it. Um, and then we do have the full user, user uh, version of it for $50,000, which is unlimited installs, um, unlimited amount of data that you send over, um, and that's $50,000 per year. So like I said, it's it's a very cost-effective way, both from the mm -hmm. eligible, um, but also, I mean, you can see here from a licensing standpoint, it's significantly less than uh, trying to do and implement something with uh, um, something with uh, ETL or change data capture or or something like that as well. So, um, all right. Um, 
Well, I actually covered the cost, um, and here's some expanded or expanded details around the cost and the licenses and and some of the data uh, sources that we that we support as well. So, any questions? I think we probably have some also in the uh, in our chat. We have one in the chat, and I believe Aaron captured a couple from registration. But the one in the chat. I hear an echo, I apologize. Um, there are actually a couple now. How do you deal with redefines statement? Um, I'll hand that over to uh, Vince. If he's still on and we can hear him, uh, I think Vince is probably the best uh, to handle that. <laughs> yeah, well, I am I am on. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Teams was a challenge today, but anyway. So the um, the data transformation component that we support has uh, you know pretty complete uh, support for things like uh, redefined statements. So you know generally the thing you want to consider is how that's going to be represented in the target database. So you know typically uh, you know what we're going to do is look at the metadata and say okay that's you know this many rows this many columns and you know so forth uh, and then we would go off and uh, you know either create a new table or or you know work with an existing table that kind of matches that definition. In the case of a redefines, it's not so much the technical issue of how you understand the data the 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 question gets to be how do you want that represented in the target database? You know, certain records might have completely different formats than other records, and if you try and put that into one database table, that may not give you what you want. The answer we provide is there are actually a few different ways this could be done. One is that you can create a table that's you know basically got you know, information, you know, the common information, and then you know, essentially some binary fields that kind of match what we found in the record. And then, you know, you're more than welcome to, you know, take that apart any way you like to within your within your applications. The other thing we can do is, uh, you know, Propels has um, the ability to limit what, it's proce what it processes by key. So, you know, you might have, you know, let's say a vSAM file on your mainframe where, you know, the different record types are um, you know, defined with different types of keys and so forth. In that case, what you might do is you might run Propel several times. You know, so the first run, you pick up all of a certain type of record that creates one table that get populated there. The next time you run it, you pick up a different record type with you know, com maybe a completely different structure and that gets populated into you know maybe a different table so you know a lot of flexibility there the um, the the challenge and i think this is true anytime that you do uh, you know the t this type of mainframe data to things like relational database the issue is how do you normalize those records how do you get them into a format in the target database where you can be able to process them the way you want to with uh, with SQL statements. The, the other thing I'll mention quickly, it's 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 a redefines, but another common thing is um, uh, records with arrays in them. So you you might have uh, you know a variable occurs n number of times. You know, so you know, again, an array is not a natural thing to try and store in a relational database. We give you a few different choices for that. One choice is, um, you know, as I described before, you can create an unnormalized field in your database that has all the occurrences of that array, and you can deal with it in your own application. If you want something a little more um, relationally pure than that, we can also use uh, what a lot of folks refer to as a subtable model. So what you would have is kind of a parent table that has the core row, and then you would have a subordinate table that has each of the instances of that array stored as a separate row. That's normalized now, right? That's a more relationally pure way of storing that data. 
and you can join that back with the with the parent table to see that view the way you might want it with all the occurrences. Uh, all of that's possible, and again, what makes sense is really going to depend on you know what your application of the data is, you know how you're trying to process it, and you know to an extent the type of database that you're going to. You know there may be different options available to you in you know, let's say Mongo or NoSQL environment versus, I don't know, Oracle or, or you know, DB2 or any other, you know, purely relational database. So, yeah, our goal is to be as flexible as possible there because I'm not sure there is, uh, you know, one size fits all right answer to these things. We, we give you the tools and you, know, you, have, you have a lot of options there. Great, thank you, Vince. Thank you, um, yeah. Another question, can you handle variable length records or variable length segments within those records? Yeah, and I'll, um, and, and absolutely, uh, the, um, the input files can be varying in length. Uh, you know, normally um, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, let's say we have a character field and it's, you know, it's just a simple text string and it could be different lengths depending on what you find in the, in, in the input file. Normally what we would do is when that goes to the database, we're going to use the database's built-in terms for that. You know, so it would be, uh, you know, most databases that's going to be a var chart, you know, variable length character field. After we do the transformation and so forth, you might find that, you know, some rows have, I don't know, 10 characters, some rows have a thousand characters. It's, uh, you know, it, it purely depends what we find in the data. That's true, by the way, for, you know, variable length um, uh, QSAM files, variable length uh, VSAM files doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't really, really matter what the underlying structure is. But, uh, you know, it all, it all works pretty much the same way like that. And, you know, and, and again, in a, in a lot of files, you you might have you know many fields that are you know varying in length that way. So you know, you might have something like in the metadata that describes that file, you might have a field that has the length of the following segment of the record. Then you have that data. Then you might have another length, and you know that data. And yeah, and and the transformation we use supports all of all of that. So you know it can be something as simple as the are no length fields, you know, just random length data and, you know, based on the physical size of the records, you know, that's what determines it. But it can also be that the lengths are defined inside the data. And, you know, in that case, you could have many, many fields each of uh, variable lengths. So hopefully that helps. And how quickly does the data load? High volume, for instance, 600,000 plus large records. Yeah, so um, so I, I'll just share a couple of data points and understand, you know, before I get into that, understand what our test environment is. Our test environment is an IBM uh, uh, ZPDT system. So, you know, we're talking a mainframe environment that's probably about 1% of what of the capacity that, you know, most of the most of you folks would have. Uh, you know, we on a, on a good day we get about nine MSUs out of our um, out, of, out of our ZPDT system. Now we connected that for a lot of the tests to a few different things. One is that we just spun up um, a MySQL instance in the Amazon cloud, and we use the free tier. So you know, this is not something that's configured for you know the maximum possible throughput we also um, kind of repeated that test uh, you know because I, I think we felt that you know we just don't have the resources to get a reasonable idea of how well this performs so we did exactly the same thing we took a local linux uh, server running mysql that's on the same uh, network segment as our ZPDT system, and we use we use that as a target to push those same records. Uh, you know, in in that configuration, um, you know, the typically what we were seeing 
is about, um, oh, and by the way, let me also mention, this is using the, the demo that, um, that actually you just saw with, um, you know, uh, you know, Richard uh, demonstrating pushing records from vSAM into a MySQL database that ultimately went into Tableau. In that case, those individual records are, you know, they're more or less about a thousand bytes each. Uh, they have, you know, on the order of, uh, uh, you know, a dozen or two individual fields. And there's some of everything in there. There's character data that was transformed to uh, UTF-8. There, there are packed decimal fields. There are, you know, binary integer fields. There are floating point fields. So, you know, it, it exercises the transformation pretty thoroughly because it's, you know, some of everything. And these are fairly large records at, a, you know, about a thousand bytes a piece. So, you know, with all of that set up, uh, what we found going to our local, uh, our, our local MySQL implementation was, you know, we had no, no real trouble getting something on the order of oh, about 300 inserts per second. Uh, through through that kind of uh, a setup, and again, this is just a you know Linux running on a kind of consumer grade network with uh, you know an Intel i7 processor, nothing nothing more than that. Uh, I would imagine it's possible to put another zero on the end of those numbers on a you know data center class uh, uh, device of some sort. A couple of things though, that stood out to us in doing this test. One of them is that um, you know when we target the cloud, uh, a lot really just depends on the quality of service that the cloud provider is uh, is offering. In that example I mentioned, where we just you know we stood up a, a, a MySQL server on the you know Amazon's free tier, yeah, you know, we struggled to get 30 rows per second out of that. And when we looked into it, it's because it's a you know really teeny amount of resources. It's throttled from a you know network bandwidth point of view, from a memory point of view, all of that. You know, so it's it's really important if you want to do high bandwidth kind of kind of loads. Uh, you know, of course, you're going to need the, the network connections to support that. You're going to need the target to be configured in such a way that it can do, you know, whatever level of I.O. performance and, you know, database performance that, um, you know, that's suggested by the, 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 the volume of data that you've got. Uh, you know, again, that's going to vary a little bit depending what your target is. You know, if you're moving something from ZOS to, you know, let's say another server in your data center, that's probably a pretty easy solution. If you're going to a cloud provider, you know, it might take some, you know, trial and error there. We also, um, you know, give you controls in Propels that allow you to optimize the, the, the way the query process works. You know, just as an example of that, with a lot of databases, uh, support the idea of batch moding uh, query. So in other words, instead of here's a query and then you know, go write it and you know, commit the record, uh, most databases have a way to say, I'm going to just send you rows, you know, maybe thousands at a time. And then when I tell you, you know, stop and do a, do a commit, we fully support that kind of thing. You can control through propels how big those batches are how often to do a commit, you know, all of all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we see in a lot of the databases that makes a huge difference in terms of overall uh, response time. So, you know, if you've got, you know, large amounts of data and you have kind of tight, um, you know, constraints on how long it has to take, I think, uh, you know, definitely you'd want to leave yourself a little bit of time to find the optimum values for um, for, for these kinds of, of settings. We found, uh, you know, just, just to kind of put that on the, uh, on, on the map, um, you know, I mentioned in our local environment, we could get 300 rows per second uh, without a lot of tuning. The only thing we really did tune was how big those batch sizes should be going to MySQL. And what we found is that kind of the default, which was 
you know, commit every record as it came through, you know, that versus committing every uh, 2,500 records, I think we found to be the optimum number for us. I mean, it was worth literally 20 to one, uh, you know, better throughput just by adding that parameter to say, you know, batch these things up a few thousand rows at a time. So, um, you know, every case will be a little bit different. It really just depends what the constraint is in your environment. Is it network capacity? Is it memory? Is it, you know, all, all of that can, you know, or, or, you know, the type of database that you're going to will certainly make a difference as well. Not, not all of them, you know, react the same way. So, yeah, there, there absolutely are a lot of things to do. And I think we've seen enough of it that we feel like it's possible to achieve pretty much any reasonable level of performance that you might expect on, on this type of thing. So it's, uh, you know, the controls are there and um, you know, we feel good about you know, being able to adapt to really whatever those needs are. Uh, you know, especially if you're doing something like file transfers and, you know, things where you're moving large amounts of data around, transforming them in, you know, batch applications or in, you know, ETL products and then populating that into a database. I think compared to that end to end, I think you'd see that, um, you know, we have the promise of being, you know, several times faster than that because it's kind of all one seamless operation that way. Okay. And there's another question that asks if uh, Propels can also be used for COBOL applications running out of the mainframe, such as on OpenText Enterprise Server. Well, so, so a couple of things there. One is, um, you know, Mark talked a little bit about our Lozen product. Our Lozen product is specifically designed to support not just kind of batching up the records and moving them, but real-time access, you know, real-time read and write access with full integrity against mainframe data in, uh, in the, the open text products that you're talking about. You know, we worked um, very closely with, uh, you know, then our friends at um, MicroFocus to design and build that. It's completely integrated into their product. So, you know, I can take source code from, you know, let's say a batch program that runs today on ZOS and references vSAM. You know, I can take that source code, build it in the enterprise server environment, execute it on, you know, Windows, Linux, wherever I want to, have it access the same exact files it's always accessed and it behaves identically. No change, no updates to the source code, you know, and, and, and on and on and on that way. So, you know, that would be our kind of premier solution for doing that. If you wanted to just, you know, grab a snapshot and, you know, push that data somewhere where, you know, a batch application could do something with it, you know, the issue that you'll probably run into is that, um, uh, you know, Propels is, is uh, uh, you know, as, as Richard described it in his demo, it's a JDBC implementation, which generally means the target is going to be a database. So that means the application that you run against that data would be doing, you know, database queries, you know, SQL or, you know, wh whatever it is, Mongo's API or, you know, something like that to get to that data. So, you know, again, if you have that, then sure, absolutely, that'll, that'll work fine. If you're expecting to, you know, just use normal, you know, vSAM type IO primitives, you know, open, close, read, write, seek to different records, you know, all the things you can do in, in vSAM, then that would probably be more of a, uh, of, of a Lozen approach, uh, you know, especially if there's any possibility that you're updating records in there as well. Great. Um, one last quick question. When will we, will we still have transmission fees associated for utilizing mainframe data on any other platform? Uh, when you, well, when we say transmission fees, I, I suppose, um, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, in and out of, uh, you know, ingress and egress fees on, you know, that the various cloud providers charge. And there, you know, it's not a simple answer. It really depends on which cloud provider and, you know, so on and so on. Uh, in, 
Yeah, yeah, I will. I will say that um, you know naturally we are consuming you know bandwidth to move the data around the, the the network. So you know there is definitely the potential for that. And it's certainly something you want to consider. Uh, you know, we're talking mainframes here, so you know th this isn't like a consumer connecting to Amazon. This is you know B two B, and no doubt folks. Um, you know, negotiate all kinds of, uh, you know, sophisticated agreements there. So it's, you know, if you're on, you know, let's say Microsoft Azure and you're using um, Microsoft's uh, Azure Express service, you know, you probably have dedicated bandwidth between your site and, and you know, the Azure cloud. And in that case, I don't believe there's any additional uh, charge over and above what that environment is costing you today. But again, it's going to vary case by case. We'd be happy to, um, you know, get in the middle of those, uh, uh, you know, discussions so that it's clear to the cloud provider what's needed, and uh, you know, you can you can negotiate that. So you know, definitely, uh, you know, give any of us a, a shout if if there are uh, you know issues in that space. We're happy to help. Well, these are great questions, Elsa. Hey, thanks. I didn't come up with them, but thank you for answering them all. <laughs> So what we wanted to close with, if you want to go back one slide, Mark, what we wanted to close with is you can start running Propels in production today. Today, you could license Propels for the limited use version and start propelling your mainframe data today. If that's of interest, please reach out to us. You can also, of course, um, license uh, Propels for an unlimited use license um, if you didn't want the 10,000 row limit, but you could start uh, using Propels in production today at no charge up to 10,000 rows of data uh, per execution. And you know we'd welcome the opportunity to help you. Thank you for the active questions and involvement. Uh, it's just unfortunately we had so many technical issues, but we hope we got there for all of you and thank you for sharing your time with us today. <laughs>